Good morning, LaSalle. Our scripture this morning catches up with Paul as he was addressing the people at Corinth. At the time, there were significant divisions and competition and disunity. Corinth was a wealthy port city noted for its licentiousness and cult of the love goddess Aphrodite. The church was divided by doctrinal disputes and rival leaderships and sexual immorality. During this particular time, the congregation met in a private home large enough to accommodate the entire group, 50 to 100 people. They were broken into several opposing cliques and sometimes member placed higher importance on the particular person who converted or baptized them, resulting in competitions with one another over the prestige of their respective mentors. Another cause of division resulted from the members' unequal social and educational backgrounds, particularly because the congregation included both slaves and slave owners. Paul's main argument here was to discourage human competitiveness. He preached that all believers were fundamentally equal. His attack on human wisdom wasn't directed against human reason or logic. It was aimed at those who boasted of special insights that supposedly gave them a deeper understanding than the understanding of his fellow believers. Paul was addressing the elitism that led some persons to cultivate a false sense of superiority that devalued less educated believers, fragmenting the congregation into groups of the wise and the foolish. Paul reminds the Corinthians that humans don't come to know God through reason itself, but that God revealed his saving purpose through Christ as a free gift. And because all are equally undeserving recipients of the divine benefits, no believer has the right to boast. Verse 18 of our scripture today says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For this purpose and in honor of Black History Month, I'd like to refer to the us in this verse as African Americans. I believe the message of the cross is the central focus for all Christians, but for African Americans in particular, I believe it goes deeper. I chose to title my sermon, The Cross or The Casket, intentionally. Years ago, when I was on staff at a nonprofit organization for underserved African American and high school youth, I had the opportunity to facilitate retreats for them each year while they were in high school. And each year, each class had a theme on which it focused. And this particular class included about 50 seniors. And the theme of their retreat was the cross or the casket. The retreat center had a chapel with a giant cross. And I had a casket brought in that was positioned directly under it. The two distinct images were very apparent to the students as they entered the chapel for our prayer service. Listen. For most of these students, this program was a lifeline for them. They had no other options. They needed mentors. They needed tuition assistance. They needed guidance, and they needed spiritual support. Church, non-negotiable. Talking about God and investigating their faith wasn't a luxury. It was a necessity, a significant part of their lives. When their family's needs were met, they believed it was God who met them. When bills were paid and tuition provided and receipt of college acceptances and scholarships, all this was from God. So, of course, being thankful and praising Jesus was the response. These young people understood that for most of them, they were given two choices, life or death, the cross or the casket. Embracing the cross, understanding that Jesus gave his life so that they could have life, was inherent to their being. Having a physical casket in their midst reminded them of the value and the gift of life. It wasn't a scare tactic, but a reminder to choose life. In all my work in African-American communities, for the most part, God was never in question. God was a given. Attending church wasn't an option. It was part of our week. No one had to suggest singing or dancing while in church. It was a natural instinct among the congregation. I never questioned any of this until I entered 
other spaces that were not predominantly African-American. Generally speaking, in these more diverse settings, I observe people as more reserved in their worship expression. No judgment. I just noticed the stark differences between people of color and non-people of color. And so I became curious and wondered why that was. Did culture play a role in how one worshiped and expressed their faith? Did the cross mean something different for people according to their culture, their ethnicity, their race, their experience? It wasn't until while at CTU when I engaged in a course called The Cross in Scripture that I found myself intentionally wrestling with the question if African Americans have a particular view of the church, specifically the cross. Initially, I found my response to be uncertain and inadequate. After all, Jesus' death on the cross and his resurrection is the event that all Christians can agree upon. So my deduction was that everyone who calls themselves a Christian understood and integrated the meaning of the cross in the same manner. In my many experiences with and exposure to various groups of people, I had seen differences among ethnic groups and how the cross was embraced. Among African Americans, I noticed a more personal interaction with the cross, even how the name Jesus was highlighted in prayer and referred to in general conversations. And I've come to understand and accept that for most African Americans, the church has been and continues to be a place of safety, a place that sustains and empowers black people to resist the forces that seem designed to destroy all dignity in our souls and our bodies. In my investigation of this question, I went back to the beginning of the history of the black church and I reviewed material from black theologians and liberation theologies and I began to understand that indeed there are differences and reasons for these differences. And so I'd like to share and review some of the nuggets. Some I already knew, some I discovered, but all were familiar to my style of worship. But now I had data, narratives, theologies, and history in which to ground them. I've always been curious as to why and how African Americans could and would be drawn to a faith that was presented in such a way that seemed to validate and co-sign with their experience of discrimination and racism. In my study and in my reading, I found numerous black theologians who have written articles and books on this subject. Allow me to summarize some of their insights as we explore this topic. All black history originates in Africa. American blacks, both Protestant and Catholic, found their roots in the black Africans who appeared in the pages of the scriptures, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament and most particularly in the many references to Ethiopia in the Psalms and in the prophets. Towards the end of the 18th century and the period before the Civil War, one Catholic theologian noted that there was a strong, continuous number of black, practicing black Catholics, despite the barriers that existed. Slave owners were reminded to baptize their slaves and ensure they receive religious instruction every Sunday but blacks couldn't make their devotions until every white person had done so. Blacks couldn't approach the cross until after the whites. The Society of Colored People, a black Catholic society that held weekly meetings, provided a unique opportunity for black Catholics to exercise some decision-making and self-government, and singing occurred during these meetings. Meetings were sometimes prolonged because of the singing of more songs. There existed a, a tenacity and a fidelity African Americans had toward their faith and the church. There was an undeniable strength and courage that linked them to their faith, that in spite of how the scripture and the church may have been misused and perverted to convert them, this people apprehended their faith on their own terms. As early as 1739, there existed revivals that included prayer and preaching that stirred intense religious emotion among the crowds of people and led many to experience conversion. Not only did free blacks and slaves attend revivals, they also took active parts in the service, praying and exhorting and preaching 
And it was this type of activity and involvement that African Americans embraced because it was both familiar to them as well as allowing space for them to feel invited and, and welcomed by others. Because Baptists and Methodists were willing to license black men to preach, a significant group of black preachers, free and slave, began during the 1770s and 1780s to pastor their own people. This, in fact, became significant in the development of African American Christianity. They began to interpret the stories and the symbols and the events of the Bible to fit the day-to-day -day lives of black people. And from here, independent black churches were established and the black church had been born. Churches played active roles in addressing the many issues, including poverty and illiteracy and continued slavery and social discrimination. For blacks, the community of the church was more than a place to worship God. It became a place for them to voice their God-given rights. They were able to put into action the very scriptures that told them they were free and that Jesus did indeed die for the liberation of all, including blacks. The black church created opportunities to embrace God and scripture and the cross in a unique and very personal way, unlike their white counterparts. Instead of rejecting Christianity, instead of rejecting the cross, they apprehended it and internalized it into their hearts and their lives, even though, even though it was the trees of the South that swayed with the stench of strange fruit, fruit that represented black fathers and black brothers and black uncles and black cousins and black friends. So often slaves had to use certain measures to like singing in code to extend messages to fellow slaves. They, they could make the most of situations by using what might be for their harm and turn it in to something for their benefit. A slave named Andrew Bryan was quoted saying this to his persecutors that he rejoiced not only to be whipped, but would freely suffer death for the cause of Jesus Christ. Whew, what must have the cross meant to him? I mean, he was able to connect his suffering with that of Jesus' suffering. In 1880, in one of the earliest surviving black sermons, Absalom Jones took up one of the most troubling questions. Why did God permit slavery? He says perhaps it was God's plan that the descendants of the slaves learn Christianity in order that they might become messengers of it to the land of their fathers. The ideal of Christianizing Africa held great symbolic value for black Americans. It offered an explanation for African American history that God was drawing good out of the evil of slavery by using American descendants of African slaves to take Christianity to the lands of their ancestors. The story of Exodus held a special meaning for slaves. They identified with the Israelites and were a chosen people that would one day be delivered. Christian slaves' identification with the biblical children of Israel was intensified by songs and sermons and prayers of the meetings. When the biblical past became dramatically present and the stories they sang about came alive, for the slave, authentic worship required an observable experience of the divine present. It ain't enough to talk about God. You gotta feel him moving on the altar of your heart. The worship experience helped Christian slaves fight off slavery's terrible power to depersonalize its victims. Black Christians realized that their experiences of discrimination, abuse, torture, death were analogous to the sufferings of Jesus. Black slaves in particular fixed their gaze on the cross of Jesus deriving a way to understand and cope with their own personal experiences of prescribed existence. They made the connection with the handing over of Jesus to his detractors and the handing over of blacks to the English, the French, the Dutch, and the Spanish. There's personal identification with Jesus' of suffering and sacrifice. African Americans found themselves in the Bible among those for whom and with whom and as one of whom Jesus lived and died the poor, the alienated, the tortured, the condemned. They did not assume that their collective story was more important than Jesus' story. 
merely the inference that the crucifixion of Jesus was a mirror of their own sufferings. African Americans tend to identify wholly with the sufferings of Jesus' story because his story tells of his profound affinity with their plight. They're committed to him because his story is their story. And it was this embracing of the cross that allowed many African American slaves to find the power they needed to survive, to be free, and to express themselves. We can't have a conversation about the cross without including Thoughts from the great libera liberation theologian, James Cone. Mr. Cone says this, there is an interconnectedness of all humanity that makes freedom of one people dependent on the liberation of all. No one can be free until all are set free. And black theology is a the theology of liberation because it is a theology which arises from identification with the oppressed blacks of America, seeking to interpret the gospel of Jesus in the light of the black condition. It believes that the liberation of the black community is God's liberation. Mr. Cohn makes a strong link between the cross and black theology. The cross and Jesus' resurrection are for African-American people, their hope and their sustenance for liberation and a resurrection of sorts from the crosses in their lives. In his book, The Cross and the Lynching Tree, Cone says that while the cross and the lynching tree are separated by nearly 2,000 years, they must be viewed together, that the former informs the latter, lynching. Lynching is a form of violence in which a mob, under the pretext of administering justice without trial, executed a presumed offender, often after inflicting torture and corporal mutilation. The term lynch law refers to a self-constituted court that imposes sentence on a person without due process of law. In the lynching era, 1880 to 1940, White Christians lynched nearly 5,000 black men and women in a manner with obvious echoes of the Roman crucifixion of Jesus. It was proclaimed that lynching was a divine right of the Caucasian race to dispose of the offending black without benefit of jury. Lynching was the white community's way of forcibly reminding blacks of their inferiority and powerlessness. To be black meant that whites could do anything to you and your people and that neither you nor anyone else could do anything about it. Lynching was a family affair, a ritual celebration of white supremacy where women and children were given the first opportunity to torture black victims, burning black flesh and cutting off genitals, fingers, toes and ears as souvenirs. The cross and the lynching tree. One is a symbol of Christian faith and the other is a symbol of quintessential symbol of black oppression in America. And though both are symbols of death, one represents a message of hope and salvation while the other signifies the negation of that message by white supremacy. The cross can heal and hurt. It can be empowering and liberating, but also enslaving and oppressive. Cone insists that we must explore and recognize their similarities. At stake is the credibility and the promise of the Christian gospel and the hope that we may heal the wounds of racial violence that continue to divide our churches and our society. Both the cross and the lynching tree are emotionally charged symbols in the African American community. Symbols that represent both death and the promise of redemption, judgment, and the offer of mercy, suffering, and the power of hope. Both the cross and the lynching tree represented the worst in human beings and at the same time, an unquenchable ontological thirst for life that refuses to let the worst determine our final meaning. Until we can see the cross and the lynching tree together, until we can identify Christ with a re-crucified black body hanging from a lynching tree, there can be no genuine understanding of Christian identity in America and no deliverance from the brutal legacy of slavery and white supremacy. How did blacks survive the terrors of this era? In addition to singing and listening to the blues, it was the church. The blues offered an affirmation of humanity. The church was where one could dip their tired bodies in the cool springs of hope. 
the place where they could wholly be themselves. And while the lynching tree symbolized white power and black death, the cross symbolized divine power and black life. Black people, knowing that Jesus went through an experience of suffering in a manner similar to theirs, gave them faith that God was with them and would never leave them nor forsake them, even in suffering on the lynching trees, just as God was present with Jesus in suffering on the cross. What could black people do except to fight with cultural and religious power and pray that God would support them in their struggle for freedom? They stretched their hands to God because they had nowhere else to turn. The songwriter wrote, Father, I stretch my hands to thee. No other help I know, for if you withdraw yourself from me, where shall I go? The final word about black life is not death on a lynching tree, but redemption in the cross. I've never felt prouder to be African American. We are a gift to this world. Let me close with a final word from James Cone, who offers us hope. He says this, the cross of Jesus and, and the lynching tree of black victims are not the same, historically or theologically, yet they are closely linked to Jesus' spiritual meaning for black and white life together. We are bound together in Christ by their brutal and beautiful encounter in this land. What happened to blacks also happened to whites. We're bound together in America by faith and tragedy. All the hatred we have expressed toward one another cannot destroy the profound mutual love and solidarity that flow deeply between us. A love that empowered blacks to open their arms to receive the many whites who were also empowered by the same love to risk their lives in the black struggle for freedom. We were made brothers and sisters by the blood of the lynching tree and the blood of the cross. No gulf between blacks and whites is too great to overcome for our beauty together is more enduring than our brutality. What God joined together, no one can tear apart. LaSalle, to experience Christ, the cross is to be committed to and devoted to Jesus, not just in our heads, but in our bodies and in our souls. I'd like to encourage all of us, especially in this series, to go deeper, to give our whole selves to the experience of the cross. Let's allow the Holy Spirit to sweep us away and take us back to when he gave his life for you and me. Allow your whole being to experience the love he expressed to us when he hung on the cross. Amen.